Hey, this is what we're going to do tonight. We're actually going to dive into the Word of God. We're going to dive into our Bibles. Um, we're in a series here called Church Under Fire, and we're going through the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going through this book chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and um, it's been really, really good. Um, tonight we're in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Okay, and um, and this is this is going to be this is going to be a good this is going to be a good time. First uh, Corinthians chapter nine, and um, I've titled this thing yeah. "Too Legit, Too Legit to Quit." Too legit, too legit to quit. Uh, is it is the uh, oh is that the same song or is that can't touch this? I think yeah. How's it go? Hey, hey, it's the girls. The girls go, hey, hey, too legit, too. All right, I think all the MC Hammer songs always are like, oh, oh, or hey, hey, or something. Yeah. Oh. All right, good. Good. I'm glad, we, I'm glad we settled that. Hey, I just want you to, do, I want, <laughs> I want you just to declare this with me. Too legit. Too legit to quit. We're going to be looking at some stuff. Now, when you, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, when you're looking at commentaries, looking at what this thing's about, most of the commentaries, most, most people that I've heard teach on this, they teach it that this is a chapter about ministers and how they handle finances. And that's true. We do get to that. But we're actually going to be getting to that next Sunday. Why? There's actually six verses that sometimes we just speed through. How many of you, when you read your Bibles, you read your Bibles like you drive? Meaning, you don't really pay attention, right? You read your Bible like, here we go. <laughs> you know, and everybody knows that when you're driving, that's your, that's your time to text message, get stuff done, and pray in the Spirit. Shadakata yasari yamandayakata. Yeah? Sometimes when we read a chapter like this, we shoot through certain portions of it, and in doing so, we miss out on stuff. And I think we have an opportunity here to not miss out on something really, really important, something that's really, really timely, and it has to do with our, with our legitimacy. So everybody there, 1 Corinthians chapter 9? Awesome. Am I not completely free and unrestrained? He, he answers his own question, and he says, absolutely. He asks the question, am I not an apostle? Of course. He says, haven't I had a personal encounter with our Lord Jesus face to face and continue to see him? Empathetically, yes. Aren't you all proof of my ministry in the Lord? Certainly. And if others do not recognize me as their apostle, at least you are bound to do so. Why, Paul? For now, your lives are joined to the Lord. You are living proof, the certificate of my apostleship. This is what he says. Who am I? I'm Paul. Am I free? Absolutely stinking lutely. I want you to do this right now. Just declare right now. I am unquestionably free. Why? Because he who the sun sets free is free. You say, yeah, but. No, 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 no buts. He said, yeah, no, no, but. You Darren, you don't know. No, 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 no buts. He who the sun sets free is free. Indeed. Yeah, but. No, no, no. You're referring to yesterday you. Yesterday you. And what happened to yesterday you? Honey, he dead. She dead. What do you mean? The yesterday you died with Christ. Died with Christ, was buried with Christ, you resurrected with Christ, and now you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. No, 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 but I'm just a sinner. You know, I'm just a sinner. No, no, no. If that's, if that's your standard, I'm just a sinner. What do sinners do? Sinners sin. We're just going to keep it basic tonight. But he who knew no sin 
became all my sin so that I could be the righteousness of Christ. What does that mean? That means I'm no longer a sinner. Honey, I'm righteous. I pure. I'm pure. I'm the 100% grade A USDA, whatever. It don't matter. Yeah. Paul says, am I free? Unquestionably free. Am I not an apostle? Of course I am. Haven't I had an encounter with Jesus? Yep, I have had an encounter with Jesus, and I encounter him daily. Well, then, how, how do you know you're really an apostle? You. You are my living proof. Now back to the reading of the word, verse 3. So do those who want to continually criticize my apostolic ministry. How many of you guys have ever known somebody that was critical? Think really, really. You're going to have to think really, really hard. How many of you think like really hard? How many of you have ever known someone in your life that was critical? Yeah. Some of you are like, Psst. Psst. please. Psst. I hear you. Psst. You're psst are resonating through the house. Yeah, why is it? Listen, critical people, that's not just a 2021 thing. Critical people, that's not just a 2020 thing. That even in the first century, there were critical Christians that were criticizing Paul. And if they're going to criticize Paul, why wouldn't they criticize Darren? You know, we don't like critique. We don't want to be critiqued. Right? We don't want to be persecuted. But we forget, we serve the dude that got crucified. You worship the guy that got crucified by the people who claim to know God. Criticism is a part of the human disposition. It comes from our fractionness. It's rooted all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. This is what Paul says. So you want to criticize me? Here's my statement of defense. Whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. Christians are supposed to defend themselves. You can't defend yourself. Well, Paul does. And this is why I didn't want to just get to ministers and finances. Why? For six verses, the dude defends himself. And we're living in a time, we're living in an era when Christians don't know how to defend themselves. And I thought, man, this would be a great Sunday for us to talk about self-defense. So now i got some slides of various handguns. If the guys would put up the, the we're going to start off with the Glock 17 model. And I just, I'm just having, I know my buddy back here is playing. He's like, look, look, I'm packing. Good, good, good. Let's keep the shirt down, right? I, 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 I know. <laughs> You're good. Someone said to me, Pastor Darren, is it cool if I, uh, if I, if I pack some heat in the service? And I, I just said, hey, all right, that's cool. The only thing I ask is that if, if you go shoot, you better not shoot me. Because, bro, I will be ticked off if you miss the bad guy and shoot me. All right, I'm glad we covered that. All right, so th where were we? He says, um, here's my statement of defense. I'm going to defend myself. Verse 4, don't we apostles, and now he's going to pivot. He's going to talk about finances. Don't we apostles have the right to be supported financially? Everyone say yes. Don't we have the right to travel with our believing wives and be supported as a couple? Say yes. And do the other apostles, such as Petey the Rock, and the Lord's brothers? He says, of course we do. Or is it only Barnabas and I that have no right to stop working for a living? Next week we're going to look at it. Paul says, I got the right, but I don't want your money. It's going to be cool. You guys are going to dig it. Paul's like, I have every right to take up a collection. And yet I'm going to keep selling essential oils. No, 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 no. Paul, <laughs> yes, he was bivocational. He didn't sell oils. I mean, he might have, but we do know that he, that he made tents, that he worked a job. So we're going to be look, looking at this thing that we have rights. 
But sometimes we lay down our rights for the integrity of the gospel. Now let's talk about you. What do you do when the enemy challenges you? What do you do when people challenge you? What do you do when that voice inside of you? I, 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 I'm going to confess something tonight. Yep, I'm a pastor, but I hear voices. I hear voices. And if you were honest, you'd admit you hear voices too. Why is it that whenever we go to do something for the Lord, why is it that whenever we're going to be obedient, why is it when we're going to take a risk, we start hearing voices? Sometimes it's the voices of other Christians. Sometimes it's the voices of, 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 of non-Christians. Sometimes it's the voices of, of the demonic. Demonic torment. And then sometimes it's our own internal voice. I'll tell, yeah, I, I wrote a book back in 2016. The whole time I was writing my first book, I heard this voice. This voice says, bro, this is crap. Why even write it? This book is crap. This is dumb on dumb. The only people that are going to finish it are dumb people. The only people that are going to buy it are dumb. I, I remember there was a, um, a, a, a review on Amazon of my book. And it said, just look past the cover. The book is actually pretty good. What was wrong with the cover? I was on the cover. I'm like, what's wrong with the cover? I'm on it. Like, just ignore the dude on the cover. The book, I hear this voice. It's crap. Guess what? The Lord used that book. All kinds of people have been saved. I've done three printings of that book. I self published Like, it's been so much fun seeing what the Lord did with that book. Listen, whenever you hear the voice, this is going to be crap. You might as well just quit. You're not legit. You're a fraud. You're an imposter. You need to be encouraged. Why? You're on to something. You're on to something. The second you start hearing voices, I hear voices. Make them leave. It's time that you do what Paul did. It's time that you do what Jesus did. You talk back. You see, the problem is, and if we're honest, we admit that there are some problems in the church. We've been taught, never respond to your critics. We've been taught, Jesus said, to love your critics. We've been taught... Turn the other cheek. We've been taught, Jesus said, always be lonely. We've been taught, Christians aren't supposed to be defenses, defensive. We've been taught, you're not supposed to show emotions. We've never actually been taught that, but we're always subconsciously reinforce and reward people when they don't show emotions. And when people are too emotional, we're like, oh, they're one of them Christians. Or when somebody's angry, we're like, well, that's not Christ-like. Because, of course, Jesus never got angry. I'm just looking to see if you read your Bible. All right. <laughs> Careful, brother. That looks like passion. You're not anything like Jesus. Jesus wasn't passionate. The problem is, is that many believers, they go to get off the ground. They got all this vision and all this passion. And they go to get off the, the ground. And the devil just comes with this big old hand and just wallops you. Just hits you. Hits you down. Maybe he uses a friend. Maybe he uses a spouse. Maybe just a dream. Maybe just a thought. And the enemy comes to beat you with a lie. Because that's all the enemy can do is lie to you. He's a thief and a liar. That's all he has are lies. And he comes to tell you something. He comes to tell you you're illegitimate. You're a fraud. You're an imposter. Paul, you're not an apostle, so just shut up. Shut your face, Paul. No one like you. Everyone hate you, Paul. And this is my question. If you're going to do anything cool for Jesus, if you're going to do anything kingdom in your lifetime, then you better be ready for this. And I want you to answer a question. Before you quit, I want you to answer this question. The question is, what's at stake? What's at stake? What was at stake with Paul? Paul says, you're questioning my authority. And here's what Paul says. Am I free? <laughs> Bro, you don't even know how free I am. Am I apostle? Oh, honey. Look. Look, I, 
I didn't create myself. I didn't call myself. I didn't ordain myself. Everything that you see all up in here, it wasn't my idea. I was minding my own business, just, just doing my thing. What's your thing, Paul? Killing Christians. I was just minding my own business, killing Christians. When all of a sudden, Jesus, him stinking self, came to me and said, why are you persecuting me? Just my own, my own business. This is what Paul says. I didn't create myself. I didn't call myself. I didn't ordain myself. He did. This isn't my thing. When you attack me, you attack attacking him. When you attack my call, you're attacking the high call. And when you're attacking this, I'm taking it personally. Why? Because I'm writing you, if you go back to the very beginning of our series, I'm writing you because I stink and love you. I'm telling you the truth because that's what love does. And I'm going to, I'm going to defend, I'm going to issue my statement of defense. Why? Because it is my apostolic duty to protect the unity in Corinth. To protect the testimony of Jesus in Corinth. Because this is my apostolic duty... You're criticizing me, and I'm going to make up my mind to not disappear. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to speak up. Why? Because I'm too legit. Too legit to quit. If we're going to do this, there's a few things I want for us to look at that I think is going to help us. And the first thing is, Paul says, look at the very beginning, chapter 9. He says, I am completely free. I am an apostle. I am. I am. I am. What's he saying? I know who I am. You're going to need to know who you are. More importantly, you're going to need to know who you're not. If you're going to stand up, if you're going to speak up, then you're going to have to know your authority. What's your authority? Your authority is in your testimony. This is what Paul says. Hey, look at the equity, the track record of my leadership. You are proof that I am legit. Guess what? You've got a call, you've got a purpose, and your purpose is composed of assignments. Guess what? There's going to be a day when I'm not pastoring SRC anymore. Yeah. There's going to be a day when I'm going to be doing something else, like bass fishing, while harassing all the young guys that think that they're apostles. I'm going to be like, come on, that's never going to work. Oh, I got to go, because I got to fish on. But this is what I know. For the rest of my life, I will always be catalyzing joy in the hearts of the saints. Why? That's my high call. Darren, you're a pastor. That's your call. No, it's my assignment. Darren, you do media. That's your call. No, that's my assignment. Darren, you're, you're, te you're teaching people how to, how, to, how to lead people to Jesus. You're an evangelist. You're an evangelist. No, trust me, I am not an evangelist. I just like to see people get saved. I am no Todd stinking white at all. I'm just proof that if I can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah, so what's your call? My call is to catalyze joy in the hearts of the saints. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I think the body of Christ is always going to need joy. And that's why the Lord has wired me this way. This isn't, this isn't fake. This is, this is who I am. In fact, I'm worse off the stage than I am on the stage. I always wait until Anthony's in the third heaven with Jesus. And then I'll just come up beside of him and go. <laughs> and he'll be like, dude, for real? What is your problem? That's who I am. God has called me to catalyze joy in the hearts of the saints. Well, that's not very spiritual. You're just religious. Get over it. I know who I am, and I know who I'm not. And this is what Paul says. I know who I am. I know my lane. Therefore, I am empowered to speak up, to stand, 
and to defend the realm of the spirit in my lane. Chris White, he was one of the guys that was uh, leading worship up here tonight. And guess, guess what? Chris knows his lane. When you, when you look, at, 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 look at this, like all, all these, I'll tell you, all these lights are all LED. They're all computerized. They can make them go woo-woo. They can do all, all, kinds of, all kinds of stuff. You know, and here's the thing is that sometimes we're like, we, we make fun of like, church, like oh, look, they think they got the fancy lights and all, what was up with all, all that smoke, like Cheech and Chong episode of it. Like, 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 I don't know, like, oh, these guys. No, 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 no. These aren't just lights. This is the product. This is the fruit. This is a certain amount of leadership equity that's been established by a young man and he's in his lane that's his authority he understands all the tech stuff he understands project management and he was working with all these different companies and drawing up all these different plans and so don't let the enemy don't let religion tell you that what pastor darren does is more important than what chris white does no chris knows his lane and because chris is in his lane i get to be in my lane Listen, maybe you're a stay-at-home mom. Maybe you're a programmer. Maybe you're an IT guy. Maybe you're, you're, I don't know what God has called you to do, but he's called you to stink and do it, and it is important. You need to know who you are, because when you know who you are, you're allowed to stand in that place of authority, and you're allowed to speak up. And guess what, you stay-at-home moms? We need to hear from you. And guess what, you educators? We need to hear from you. Guess what? You CFOs. We need to hear from you. Yeah, guess what? You, you, you retired peeps, you generals. You've, you've, done your, you've done your part. And now you're in this, this stage of life. We need to hear from you. I mean, just say, know who you are. De- declare that loud. You need to know who you are. You need to know who you are. The next thing is, you need to know what the Lord has done. Number two, know what the Lord has done. This is what Paul says, I know who I am, and I know what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. This is three things. Are you ready? Testify, testify, testify. And it says in Revelation, they overcame the enemy with the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Listen. Testimony is a big deal, but my testimony is so old. Testimonies don't age. They don't? No, if testimonies got old and therefore irrelevant, that's a worldly concept, by the way. I'm old, so I'm irrelevant. Read your Bible. How old is the Bible? If that's true, just throw away your Bible. That's old revelation. No, it's not. That your Bible, that's a portal. It's alive. It's got wah, 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 wah all over it. You begin to read, all of a sudden, you're no longer reading it, and it's now reading you, and you're like, how did it know that? How did it know that? Testimony. There's no, it it ain't milk. There's no, you don't have to pour out your testimony because it's gone bad. They overcame the enemy with the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And Paul uses his testimony to establish and to remind people of his authority. Listen now, you need to remind people what the Lord has done. And that means that we are to talk about what the Lord has done and we're to talk about it often. We're encouraged, right? Uh, In the books of Moses, we're encouraged to talk about what the Lord has done, what he's doing, what he's going to do. We're supposed to do it with our children to impress it upon them often. So I'm going to tell you how to do that. And this is going to be really, really good. Especially when it seems like nobody, you know, nobody sees who you really are. You're like, I'm, I'm so anointed. I got so much glory, but nobody sees it on me. <laughs> Man, if you only knew who I was, you'd give me a mic. Yeah, what's the brother got to do to get it? Like, okay, listen, you guys, we need to talk about what the Lord has done, what he's doing, and what he's about to do. And here's a tip. When you talk about what he's about to do, exaggerate it. The Lord spoke to prophet Bobby Connor. He said, you have permission to exaggerate what I'm about to do on the earth. 
Why? You're going to fall drastically short of what I'm actually going to do. Your eyes haven't seen. Your ears haven't heard. Your imagination is not perceived of the wild things that God is about to establish. You want to see a move of God? Just say yes. Do you want to be a part of a move of God? Then you're going to have to talk about the movements of God. The slightest, our eyes need to be so on God that we notice the slightest twitch of his eye. Our eyes are so fixed on him. Did you see that? Did you feel that? That's his spirit. It's here. Bro, shh, shh, shh. Did you hear that? He's here. God is here. God is here. God is here. What's God done in your life? What's he saved you from? Talk about it. But Darren, that's 20 years ago. Darren, that's embarrassing. Talk about it. Talk about it. What's he doing? Can I just tell you what God's doing? Can I tell you, last Sunday, we had 105 new people at SRC downstairs eating food together, breaking bread together, talking about Jesus. People so stinking excited about what Jesus is doing and in Seattle of all all places. Yo, for the people online... God's moving in Seattle. <laughs> if, trust me, if, if God is here, he's definitely there. Yeah, guess what? This morning at 8.30, I was in the old chapel with uh, uh, 40 plus people crammed up like sardines in the old chapel talking about the love of God. And these are people that are saying, we want to be members at Seattle. They had to close it down at 40 people, right? Because they're like, where are we going to put all people? Well, we're going to have to figure that out this week because after the service, I had all these people coming. I want to enlist. I heard you guys are building an army. Count me in. Count me in. Come on. This afternoon, Pastor Gail did a prayer ministry team training. Over 40 people, uh, including volunteers. They had over 50 people downstairs eating together. What were they talking about? How are we going to minister to the hearts of the saints? How are we going to see people set free of demons? How are we going to see people um, uh, uh, healed and inner healed and physically healed? They were having conversations. They were discussing. They're talking, about, let's put together a schedule. Let's make sure that every service, we've got our best, our brightest. We're prayed up. We're ready to go. At the end of the service, we're going to open things up. You're going to have an opportunity to get some fire hands laid on you. If you've got demons, we're going to cast them out. If you've got pain, we're going to declare healing in your body. Why? I don't know. That's what the Bible said to do. Jesus didn't say pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. He didn't say pray for the dead. He said raise the dead. He said freely you've received now. Freely, 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 freely give. And what are you going to do when God uses you? You're going to testify, testify, testify. And the the devil's going to say, oh no, but you're just bragging. You're just doing that. Shut your face, devil. I'm going to celebrate what Jesus just did through me. You're not going to rob me of this testimony. Why? Because when I share this, it's going to build faith. And all of a sudden, instead of dispensing ugliness on Facebook, I'm going to create a realm of faith on Facebook. And all of a sudden, headaches are going to start getting healed. Why? Because Jesus just healed my headache because I commanded it to go. Well, look what the Lord has done. Oh, look what the Lord has. Oh, he healed my body. He touched my mind. He set me free. I got a dead. Oh, I'm going to praise his name. Each day is just the same. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Ooh. Testify. Testify. <laughs> you got to know who you are. You got to know what he's done. You got to know what he's doing. And honey, you got to know what he's going to do. Well, what YouTube channel? No, 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 no. You don't need a YouTube channel. You need to tune in. I love it. This guy, I talked to him today in the service. He said, I wouldn't normally go to a church called Seattle Revival Center. That just sounds like one of them churches. 
He says, just sounds like one of those woo-woo churches, Seattle Revival Center. He said, my wife brought me here because of, of an event that she heard about that you had. He goes, but guess what? I like it because you guys value the Spirit and the Word, the movement of the Spirit in truth. Darren, why are you saying that? Because I got to talk, talk about it. I got to talk about it. I got to speak up. I'm in my lane right now. This is what I do. I talk about Jesus. I talk about what Jesus has done. I talk about what Jesus is doing. And what's he going to do? There's going to be a revival center. Might not belong to me. There's going to be a revival center in Seattle. There's going to be an outpouring of his presence in downtown stinking Seattle. It's going to be a church that doesn't sleep. It's going to be praise, prayer, worship, intercession, homeless people finding a home, orphans finding a father, a people with opioid addiction broken, demons coming out, the dead coming back to life. It's going to be the body of Christ. It's going to be churches partnering together, not just our own little thing. Listen, if another church beats us to it, then we'll collaborate. We'll join. We'll serve. We'll give. Hey, if Bethel wants to come and do Bethel, Seattle, we'll partner. We'll give. It doesn't have to be our thing. It has to be his thing. It has to be the presence of the Lord. That's what he's going to do. That's what he's going to do, James. That's what he's going to do. That's what he's going to do. I'll tell you something, but you can't tell anyone. Our little secret, and everyone else watching online, we're going to go look at some properties downtown. We're going to go look at a place in Belltown. We're going to go look at a place in the UW. And by the way, there's no way in the natural we can do that. But I'm not a natural guy. There's no way that we could normally do that. But we're not a normal church. We're weirdos. We think that God can do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a weirdo. I think God wants to give me the city. You're a weirdo because you think it too. You think that God's going to give you the city. Come on. Come on. What has he done to, to, to talk about it? What's, what's he doing to, to, to talk about it? What's he going to do? Prophesy it. Speak it. Declare it. God never does a thing unless he first declares it. Everything that Jesus did, he first spoke it, and then he demonstrated it. And the third thing is this. Are you ready? Number one, know who you are. Say, know who you are. Say it all. Look at the person next to you. Say, know who you are. I know who you are. Number two, know what the Lord has done talk about it okay and number three pick your battles you got to pick your battles this is what Paul says I don't go around defending myself with everyone I'm not the aggressive apostle I'm not looking for a fight I'm in this fight why because I love you because I love you Listen, if you're not sticking up for something, if you're, not, if you're not defending something, if you're not willing to fight for something, then maybe you lost your love. Maybe you lost your first love. Listen, I love my family. I love my children. My children are innocent children. They don't deserve to be harmed, and they certainly don't deserve to die. I love my wife. I, 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 yeah, and here's the thing. My role as a husband and as a father comes first before being a pastor. Yeah. That, what does that mean? That my primary responsibility is to protect and to provide for my family. Yeah. And if I wasn't here, I'd have a job somewhere else. I'd be providing for my family. And if I didn't have a job, I'd have a bow and arrow and I'd be out in the woods. Killing whatever I could find to feed my family. Because that's what dudes do. Dudes work. They fish. They hunt. They provide. They protect. Yeah. That's what they do. Bad things happen when dudes don't work. I'm just saying. I'm just 
Same. You don't have a job? Go volunteer somewhere. Come volunteer here. But dudes, you do not want to be at home all day sitting around. Well, I only watch Christian YouTube videos. You do right now. Dudes need to be working. Especially you single dudes. I'm telling you, the ladies are not into dudes that don't know about protection and provision. I'm glad we dealt with that. Okay, good. <laughs> now, here's what I know. If you, not you, you wouldn't do this. If someone else were to break into my home, they're not going to meet Pastor Darren. They're going to meet the Terminator. If you were to break into my house and harm my children, my innocent children that don't deserve to be harmed, I'm not going to open the door and just say, come on in, because that's what Christians do. A Christian is just like a Barney purple dinosaur, and I love you. So I love you, you love me, come on in. Oh, oh, oh. No, if you break it, you're not going to hear the I love you song. You're going to hear the ch -ch of my 12-gauge shotgun. You're going to hear the chunk chunk. And that, that's the grace period. That's grace. Grace is that I'm not going to use a pistol that is very quiet. I'm going to let you know my intent. My intent is not to send you to hell. I, I heard a pastor recently say, I would never shoot an intruder because that would send them to hell. No, their unwise choices sent them to hell. And I'm not sending them to hell. I'm sending them to meet Jesus. And then whatever they work out, it'll go from there. Pastor Darren, what are you saying? I'm saying, I love my stinking family, so I'm willing to fight for them. Amen. But there are other battles I'm not willing to die for. There are other things that are not in my lane that are none of my business. Here's the thing. If I start comparing myself to you or to somebody else, I'll find myself fighting their giant, and the grace won't be there for me to slay it. You got to do you, boo. You got to stay in your lane you got to fight your giant. But this is what I know. If you love something, if you love someone, you'll be willing to speak up. You'll be willing to show up. You'll be willing to defend your family. You'll be willing to defend the kingdom. You'll be willing. I love my family. I love Seattle Revival Center. Because of that, I am fighting for Seattle Revival Center. I'm fighting for the integrity of the church. I'm fighting for the unity of the church. So every so often, Pastor Darren got to speak up. Every so often, Pastor Darren has to go live on our, on our closed Facebook group, okay? Okay. To talk about the stuff that we, not everybody else gets to hear. I'm talking to my family because we got to talk about some stuff. Why? Because that's what leaders do. They show up, they speak up, they have difficult conversations because that's what love does. I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling with you, okay? So don't take this as like, what's up? You're like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm a passionate guy. I like passionate stuff. I, favorite movie, Braveheart. So just, you know, oh, this is, we're just getting to know each other. It'll be all right. Here's, here's the next thing. I love the United States of stinking America. I love this country. I believe that this thing was a God dream. I believe that what we have is still one of the greatest models of democracy in the world. And no matter what happens, there's no place that I would rather be than in the USA. And that means that I got to show up. That means I got to speak up. And that means I got a lot more authority and influence than just that one time every four years when I cast my vote. There are some things that really matter. There are some things where we need to vote. We need to speak up. We need to volunteer. We need to donate. We need to give of our funds. There are things that are worth talking about. There are things that are worth fighting for. There are issues. And this is what I know. I've never actually literally fought for our country. But there are men and women here tonight, and you have. Thank you. Thank you for serving our country. Thank you for being willing to fight and to die. 
What should we say then? Now, now Christians don't fight for their country. Hogwash. Christians don't fight. Christians don't speak up. Christians don't use them. Christians don't. Yes, they do. Read your Bible. Christians aren't sarcastic. Read Paul. Read Corinthians. Read Elijah. I will not apologize for a second about this weirdo thing that God created called Darren. I am in him. He is in me. If I'm out of line, I'm correctable. I am rebukable. This, this is what I know. I ain't turning myself down in order to be some sort of passive, limp-wristed example of what a Christian should look like. No, I got to show up. I got to speak up. I got to read the Word of God. I got to teach the Word of God. It is my role to partner with the Holy Spirit to say it is our time to arise and shine and awaken people to their identity and their destiny in Jesus. I said awaken people, and that means we got to arouse the hearts of the saints. Why? Because we've been passive, we've been asleep, we've been tired, we've been weak for way too long. But it's shifted, it's changed. Pick your battles. Some things are worth fighting for. Other things are not worth fighting for. And this is what I want to give you. Is the fight taking you in the right direction? Is it taking you into your destiny and destination? Or is the fight just a distraction? I find myself in some, some things sometimes. And sometimes it's too late. And I find myself... With my slingshot, you going down. And God's like, this ain't your giant. This ain't your giant. Or this giant ain't worthy of your stone. We pick our Bibles. Is this taking me in the right direction? Is it taking me into my destiny and my destination? Or is it a distraction? And when you know who you are, and when you know what the Lord has done, and when you're choosing your battles, guess what happens? You wake up in the morning looking like this guy. You get the check mark. You bona fide. You legit. Tomorrow morning, I want for you to wake up Monday morning, and I want you to smile at yourself in the mirror. I want you to declare, the earth is going to be better because of me. I declare that over my children all the time. This earth will be better because of me. You're legit. And the lie of the enemy, the big fat hand, the big fat lie of the enemy is that you're illegitimate, you're an imposter, you're a fraud, nobody loves you, they're all just going to reject you. And that is a lie from the enemy. You didn't create yourself, you didn't call yourself, you didn't anoint yourself, you didn't ordain yourself. He did. In eternity past, he knew you. And then he formed you and framed you. He knit you together. He wrapped you in all of the human DNA of your mommy and your daddy. But your spirit man was a God breath, a God dream. It says that he knew you intimately in the same way that a husband knows his wife and creates a child. He knew you like that back in the was was. You're here for such a time as this. I'm going to tell a quick story, and then Pastor Sandy is going to come up here, and she's going to release a prayer of legitimacy on us tonight. I was, uh, I was driving down the road, and again, I don't do this all the time, but um, I was doing this this particular day. I was driving, and the Lord highlighted a house. So I pulled over, and I went walking up to the, the, the door, and... Um, and the guy answered, I said, now listen, this is going to sound weird, but the Lord highlighted your house. And he said, okay, you want to come in? <laughs> and I was like, no, but I did, you know. <laughs> I went into the stranger's house and he's like, do you want some coffee? And I was like, no, but I did. I had some coffee. So now I'm in a stranger's house drinking the stranger's coffee. And so... I, I did what I do. I didn't know what to say. That's how the Lord works with me. I, I, I never quite know what I'm doing. I just know that the Lord highlighted something. 
And so I just ask a question. I just get people talking. And I let them talk until Jesus starts talking to me. And once his voice is louder than their voice, I kindly interrupt them and I let them know what Jesus is saying. So we're sitting there and he's opening up. I guess we've got rapport. We've got trust. There's a stranger in his house. He's opening up. He starts telling me he's a Mormon. And I'm like, praise the Lord. He starts telling me all the stuff that he does for the, for the Mormon church. You can go ahead and uh, do, your, your, do your deal, bro. We're sitting there, and all of a sudden, as he's talking, Jesus starts talking to me, and he shows me the boy, this guy's adult, okay, his childhood when he was a, a boy, and I see his dad throw him up against the wall. So obviously, he was raised by, with an abusive father. And he's talking and talking and talking. Finally, I said to him, I said, hey, hey, bro, real, real quick. Sometimes we have dads that don't know how to be good dads. And sometimes they, they try their best, or maybe they don't even try their best. Um, but sometimes when we're raised with dads like that, where our dad doesn't know how to show us affection, then we start doing a lot of works in order to try to get our dad's attention. I said, bro, wait, everything that you, you're telling me is amazing. You volunteer at the food bank. You, you serve this. You do that. I can tell that you're working real, real hard. You're doing a lot of stuff because you're trying to get your dad's attention. And then I told him a story, and I'll tell you this story right now. So Jesus, because he was considered illegitimate, because Joseph was not his biological father, didn't receive his bar mitzvah when he was 13 years old. A bar mitzvah for a Jewish boy, that's a big deal. That's when they throw a big party for you, and your dad picks you up, a little boy that hasn't done anything cool yet, and your dad picks you up and says... This is my celebrated son in whom I am pleased. Every Jewish boy would get to be celebrated and honored by their own dad as a rite of passage to step into manhood. Jesus didn't get that. Now, before Jesus did anything cool, before Jesus did any sort of ministry, he first got baptized by John the Baptist. Imagine being John the Baptist and getting to baptize Jesus. John says, I'm not even worthy to touch your shoelaces. John baptizes Jesus in the water. And what happens? When Jesus comes out of the water, a dove comes down. The Holy Spirit comes down. And the voice of his real daddy comes from heaven and says, This is my celebrated son in whom I am pleased. That he got his bar mitzvah. He got that proclamation of legitimacy spoken over him because every little boy should know that he's legitimate and celebrated so that they don't have to perform for legitimacy and honor. I'm sitting there and this Mormon guy is weeping. And guess what? I'm weeping too. Two strangers, drinking coffee, crying together. I said, bro, can I pray for you? He said, yes. I stood up from my chair. I walked over to his chair, put my hand on his shoulder. And I began to pray a prayer of legitimacy, declaring that there's not one thing that he can do that'll make his daddy not love him. There's nothing that he can do that'll make his daddy love him more. I declared you are legitimate.
because of what Jesus has done for you. SRC, we're going to do a lot of cool stuff. But that doesn't determine our value. SRC, we're going to fail at some stuff. You're going to make some messes, not me. You're, you're going to make... <laughs> I don't make messes. No, no. You're going to fall over on your bike. And when you do, we're going to celebrate you. Because whether you're successful or whether, you're, whether you fail, you're still valuable, you're still loved, and you're still worth fighting for. And you need to hear that tonight. And so do I. I need to hear that tonight. To be affirmed by a father is something that you don't just need in your past. It's something that we need in our present. To be reminded, why am I here? I'm here because you created me. I am your seed. I'm your offspring. I'm your boy. And you my dad. And no matter what happens, no matter, no matter if I build something up or screw something up, you'll still be my dad. And if I run from you or run to you, you're still my dad. And you'll still love me. And your arms will always be open wide. I'm so grateful for my mom. My mom used to tell me all the time growing up, she would say, Darren, if you choose to love Jesus for the rest of your life or if you choose to deny Jesus, I'll always be your mom. And I will always love you. And you need to hear that tonight. Whether you choose him or you deny him, he'll still be your dad. His arms will still be open wide. He's proud of you. I don't know about you, but when people celebrate me, especially when I don't deserve it, it pulls out the best part of me. Tonight, you need to hear this. God is not tolerating you. He's celebrating you. Before you've done anything cool, before you've done any mystery, he wants you to know, that's my boy. I got your picture on my refrigerator, and every time I look at it, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I did good with that one. Everybody in this section, he looks at you, and God's like, whoa. Angels, look at these guys. You make his heart go pump, 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 everybody in this section. He loves you. He created you. He's proud of you. You're worthy to be celebrated as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Everybody in this section, he loves you. And this isn't metaphorical hallmark love. This isn't Valentine's Day love. God bless that, right? <laughs> this is legit, pure, no strings attached. He doesn't just love you because of something you can do for him. He loves you because you're his offspring. You're his seed. Everybody in this section over here, guess what your dad's doing? He's, he's celebrating you like you just, like you just hit a home run. Even if you just struck out again. That was my baseball story. Ah, oh, again. And look over and see my dad. That's my boy. You see how he held the bat? See how he hugged the plate? That's my boy. You're legitimate. You're legitimate. You are loved. You got someone who's fighting for you. You got a daddy who's speaking up for you. And now it's our honor to stand for him, to speak for him, to make the right choices and wise choices for him. Not to earn his love, but because we are loved. Now we get to stand, speak, stay in our lane, stick up for that which is right, to fight for the hopeless. Not partnering with destruction, but partnering with redemption and restoration. Not with disunity, but creating a frequency of honor, which is the culture of heaven. Thanks, bro. Pastor Singh.
Well, if you're not free after that, my goodness. I mean, why am I even up here? <laughs> um, I just, I want to give my testimony. Um, about probably maybe 15 years ago, or downstairs when Pastor Greg was here, we were just passing each other in the hallway downstairs, and and um, we got quite a ways from each other, and Greg turned and said, Sandy, and I turned around and I said, yes. And he said to me, you are legitimate. And... I can't really tell you what happened, uh, but something on the inside took a huge shift in me. And if I close my eyes, I can still feel that today. Now, I'm not saying that everything went super dandy after that in my life and, you know, that I had angels and, and out-of-body experiences and all the money I could have. No, I didn't. But just being here and knowing what I'm called to do here or wherever I, d I, I think I was working at that time, there was a difference in standing up and speaking. There was a difference. I had, I did grow into it. You grow into it. So I don't want to paint this picture of, you know, all these, that's not true, but there was a shift on the inside of my being. And I really believe today is a shift for all of us in this place. So uh, if you just want to assume the position, if you want to stand up, that's fine. If you don't want to stand up, that's fine. Just put your hands out tonight. We have a Father that truly, truly loves us. Uh, the scripture that Pastor Darren brought up early is, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That is a powerful, powerful statement. He who knew no sin became sin for me, that I might stand. That brings about a legitimacy in my life, in your life. Have Think about this. Has God ever, ever made anything that was illegitimate? No. Has God ever made anything missing parts or... or defective or no no he hasn't ever and he never will and he made you and he made you you were his idea you sat in the councils of heaven before you hit this earth and you agreed you agreed with in the councils of heaven and what you would do and who you would be here now maybe you know some of us haven't quite hit all of that yet but you as a legitimate person the heart of God, that's who you are. So, Father, tonight, we, uh, together, we repent, Lord, any place that we have come into agreement with that accuser spirit, that accuser of the brethren that would say you're not legitimate, you're not significant. We repent, Lord, where we have come into agreement with that spirit, with that voice, and we turn, Lord, we turn. We break agreement in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Father. We thank you for truth tonight, Lord. We thank you, God, that he who knew no sin became sin, our sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we thank you for that, Father. Father, I remove the, the I pluck up the, those words of accusation, those words of illegitimacy or insignificance I pluck them up now out of the souls out of the uh, memories even God of, of everybody under the sound of my voice tonight I thank you Father that this is a night of shift this is a night of change I thank you we pluck up those words of death we pluck up those words of illegitimacy and uh, Father we plant the word I plant the word you are legitimate you are significant. Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, according to Psalm 139. I pray, Lord, that be it unto them everything you wrote in that book before there was ever one of their days. Everything written, let it be unto them, Lord, in fullness, in beauty, in truth, in freedom in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. 
I thank you, God. We receive tonight, Lord. We receive. As I just declare, you are legitimate in your purpose, in destiny. You are a legitimate woman. You are a legitimate man. You are a legitimate daughter of God. You are a legitimate son of God. Legitimacy is yours in fullness. And so, Lord, I bless your people tonight. I bless your people tonight. I thank you, Father, that for that shifting, even in dreams, even in visions tonight, God, that uh, any tail end of anything, Father, would be uh, eradicated tonight. We thank you, Lord, for that right standing with you, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. So I speak the blood of Jesus over everyone's eye gates, ear gates, imaginations. Over the eye gates that you would see yourself standing in beauty, standing in truth, standing in honor standing as your father's looking at you with great desire great desire over your ear gates that you would hear your father call you you're my son you're my daughter your life is significant your life is legitimate over the gates of your imagination that you would be able to grow you would be able to uh, move into expansion and on the understanding of the love of the Father for you. So I bless your people tonight, God. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. We thank you that our hearts are filled with hope. Hearts are filled with hope. We remove hopelessness tonight in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, that I just declare everybody in this room is a prisoner of hope. A prisoner of hope that hope is anchoring our soul tonight. And thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy that endures forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are we going to do ministry team? Uh, so if the ministry team would come forward, if you would like prayer for anything, tonight. We have a team of people that would love to pray for you. Otherwise, be blessed. We'll see you next week. Hey, everyone. Welcome to SRC. Here are your latest news and happenings. We have our annual business meeting for our church on March 7th. That's just going to be following our 11 a.m. service. So it's going to be an opportunity for us to look back on all the awesome stuff that God did in 2020. A look also into 2021. Uh, we'd like all members to be in attendance if possible. And it's also open to non-members as well. We have our next Ladies Tea Talks. It's happening on March 6th. That's Saturday morning. Um, so ladies, if you could come to that and also bring a bite of something tasty to share. And we're going to be upending the church on Saturday, March 13th for a big spring cleaning. So we would appreciate all the help that we can get that day. Um, you can scan the QR code on your morning's bulletin, or you can also visit our website uh, to let us know that you're coming. And also if you would like lunch that day. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be a big undertaking and it is definitely all hands on deck. So also a reminder that as we launch our 6 p.m. service today, we are building teams. So if you can help on our PC, cameras, children's ministry, or A team, we would love to have you join us for that as we build our 6 p.m. team. Uh, you can scan the uh, QR code on your bulletin and you can also visit our website to apply. And as always, we have a lot more events happening going on at SRC. So to keep up to date with the latest, make sure you visit our website at seattlerevivalcenter.com.